Hey everybody, uh, this is Dan. I am live for another Art Camp crit that I'm going to be doing uh, for a couple hours. Um, today I'm going to be looking at this piece, which was submitted on the forum. I uh, can't remember whose it was, but uh, yeah. So many new submissions, which is a good thing. Um, very quickly, before I came live, while I was setting up live stream, I, uh, I grabbed a couple references off Google. Um, I was looking at uh, different environments that lemurs are in and different things I could do. And uh, <clears throat> one thing that really struck me about this was um, he's kind of on a vignette with like a rock and some grass and some moss at the bottom. And uh, then there's just kind of this weird lemony green yellow washed out super bright background. <clears throat> which I think actually um, really throws the colors in a weird direction and doesn't really sit uh, very well with this character. It's a, it's a very weird color to have as a background. Um, so the first thing I did was I looked at some environments that lemurs are in. I found this really nice reference of a lemur um, sitting on some grass in front of a rock face that's casting a shadow. And I thought, uh, I'll get into what I'm going to do with that later, but um, that gave me an idea for what I could do given the elements you've already put in the illustration to give it a bit more narrative, a bit more of a setting. Um, because you already put him in sort of a semi-environment with the vignette, I'm just going to expand what you started, basically, and run from there. So first thing I did was select out the background and change the color with a blue. Um, I just washed that in on a color layer. Then I put in an, uh, a multiply, and I darkened it up. And then I got some more uh, grass color down in the bottom. And then I started saturating the background a little bit. I might bring some of the blue back as we go forward. Um, but basically, what I'm going to do with the background as we go forward is I'm going to make it look sort of like uh, a culture thing. I'm going to put some carving and some ruined stuff back there to make a little more sense with the character. <coughs> Forgive me, I'm still coming off my tonsillitis so I'm gonna be coughing and my voice might be a little weird but uh yeah so I'm gonna start building this up um, to make it more of a scene more of a narrative environment that this character's in and uh, hopefully it makes sense and you understand what I'm doing and uh, we can go from there there's some other stuff I'm gonna do to the character I'll get into that as I go forward but uh as always if anyone has anything they want me to talk about just drop it in the chat and uh, I'm just gonna go forward with this and uh yeah oh this is yours uh purple mons i hope i said that right gonna extend the canvas a tiny bit so it's more rectangular and his eyes are closer to that third compositionally uh i just feels better. Feels like there's more breathing room. <coughs> Again, sorry for uh sorry for my voice being absolute trash. I'll do my best. communicate regardless. But uh, yeah, so basically I'm just going to put this character in an environment that feels like it works with the costume you designed and the little vignette you had started. That's really the uh, that's the big thing right off the bat. Just something that makes him pop more because he's catching a lot of light. And uh, one of the references I found that works really well for what I'm trying to do, what I wanted to do, I wanted to put him on a darker background so he popped because there's so much white in the character. And just by chance, I happened to find this reference over here on the bottom that works really, really well because it's almost the same lighting scheme you gave him as far as that really strong rim light from the side. So I'm going to be borrowing a lot from that and uh, pulling that into the illustration a good amount. But, uh, yeah.
there's a small chance I'm gonna have to put on music tonight. I underestimated what uh, talking for two hours was gonna do to my throat yesterday. Apologies again. I'm just gonna keep apologizing forever. Um, so I'm gonna get rid of the gray that's in that rock here. So one weird thing right off the bat with this rock is it's a tangent. See this little loop here? You go down the back of his coat and then you curl up the tail and the top of the rock is perfectly sharing an edge with that. So it's making a really, you can't even see the rock as a result. So I'm going to drop the rock down. There's no reason for it to be that high. Um, I'm just going to bring the background in here. Bring the tail up and thin it out as it's coming out of the back. You know, add another stripe here. <coughs> I'm going to clean up the artifacting later. Right now I'm just trying to get my general idea down. There's still some weird green artifacting from when I cut the background out in the beginning, so don't worry, I'll get to that. I'll get to that once I know exactly what I'm doing with this. Basically, when you're thinking about uh, illustration, concept art, any of that stuff, especially illustration, if you want something to pop, like if it's a character in an environment and you want one to pop, um, the only trick you really need to think about is opposites. Um, nine times out of ten, opposites is what's going to do it. So, you know, if the character is really light or he's catching a really strong rim light, then, you know, you want to put him against something dark to make him pop. If the character is really colorful, desaturate the background. If the character is really desaturated, color the background. You know, opposites are what pushes foreground and background. They're what makes things focal points. It's kind of the root of all, you know, visual tricks and all illustration. It's just, you know, proper use of opposites. Hard edges versus soft edges, you know, detail versus non-detail. It's just, you know, proper use of opposites is really the, the big thing to watch out for. <coughs> Get in here real quick. Just looking at how the hair works on lemurs real quick. I'm not trying to change your design too much. Just trying to get it to look a little bit more like the animal. And so they got these cool eyelash things that kind of pull up out of the eye. I do that. Actually. <coughs> I forgot to do something I always do when I pull these off the forum because they're so low resolution. I'm going to up it to 2500 at 300 dpi, which is going to make some stuff a little pixelated, but it just gives me more resolution to do a paint over with. So, apologies. I always forget to do that. Once you start getting down into the single pixel areas with a low resolution image, your brush strokes don't even show up. There's just not enough real estate on the canvas to even register what you're doing. So it's always important to do that at the beginning if you're blowing up with something small for a paint over. Ha <laughs> 
<coughs> so they've got these really long tails and your character is already stylized and the back of his tail is just kind of like this nub that's coming out from the side so uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is like extend that tail make it a bit more playful um, really really thin it out where it's coming out of the body so it has more of a taper to it um, and then really push this curve here and then over here um, there's just like a nub again it's just it's just sharing too much of an edge so I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it out like like this and let it really because uh, they they get pretty big you know looking at the uh, the source material I'm gonna kinda use it as a way to bring the character you know you want you want lines that point into where the focal point is so this curve right here is kind of indirectly pointing at the face and then if you loop it down over here it kinda makes a figure eight where it's just curving back into itself on the face so yeah <laughs> That's a nice little compositional trick to just sort of reinforce where you want the people to look, which is the character's face. <coughs> Since you're in here, um, I get to ask you some actual questions, which is nice, because usually I have to make up what I'm looking at. I'm not usually sure. Um, with this character, what is the, uh, the kind of culture costume thing you're going for with this character? Because... I see kind of this almost like Tai Chi outfit he's wearing, but then it's got like mummy bandages on all of his limbs and stuff. So I just kind of wanted to know, I just kind of wanted to know like what, specifically why the bandages are there. Um, what's the idea for the costume? What is this character? What's his role? Why is he dressed that way? Because before I quit the costume, I really would like to know your intentions so I can like, you know, play to what you're going for as opposed to just changing everything <laughs> but uh yeah feel free to type that in the chat so I can um, take a look There's a lot of weird brown greens creeping into this palette. I might have to do like a color layer wash at the end because that that lighting that you started with um, was really really pushing all the colors into like an extreme yellow green weird area. And remember, I'm I'm red green colorblind, so those neutrals are especially hard for me to see. So I might have to color wash some stuff at the end just to be absolutely sure. Again, apologies if something is green where it shouldn't be in this piece. These are always tricky for me. I'm gonna make some hairs sticking out that'll also point to the face. You know, just some little reinforcement. <coughs> okay, creator of the piece says, well, I was trying to make characters for a story I was trying to make any sort of came out of it his main thing is a sort of message man so he would be the dude to make quick messages but he's kind of reckless at what he does and he gets cut up rushing a lot to the okay so those are literal bandages like he's hurt bandages 
Okay. I took it as, because of the pose, he was some kind of, like, karate tai chi lemur who'd be jumping around and doing kick flips in the air and punching dudes and slapping people with his tail and he had wraps on his limbs because he, you know, needed the support like an MMA fighter would do or something like that. Uh, he's in a very, like, you know, five-finger death punch, tai chi pose, like, stance sort of thing right now. He's ready to jump. So I don't know if you can see what I'm talking about uh, now that I've explained it, but that's that's really what I thought this character was. <coughs> Especially this arm coming forward with the open hand and the expression on his face. He's just kind of like, you know, he's ready to go. Uh, because this is starting to freak me out a little bit, I'm going to grab a color layer real fast and grab a warm brown and just very quickly, it's a little too warm, just very quickly come in here and kill some of these grains. I'm going to grab a gray first, neutralize some of the grain, just because I am red green colorblind, and I can tell it's kind of going to cause a problem. <coughs> Okay. Sorry. Does it bother you that I saw him as a fighter type, and do you care if I critique him that way? Because I feel like that's more what this is leaning towards, but if you're really attached to the character and you want him to be a messenger that runs around, I can certainly do that too. Okay, cool. Thanks. <coughs> so for anyone listening who wasn't here last night, uh, basically I had tonsillitis for two weeks and uh, I couldn't talk. I just recently got my voice back enough that I can do this, so making up my hours this week for the time I lost, I apologize. So I'll be on here every day, doing a few hours of crits this whole week, and then we'll be caught up for the month of July so far. Gonna add some more rocks so it's not just that one rock right there. <coughs> <coughs>
if I were to change the character into more of a messenger, what would I do with the design? Um, I would put him in less of a fighting pose. I would probably put him in a pose like he's either looking over his shoulder mid-run or like uh, just something something agile. Right now he looks like he's he's ready to leap out and fight somebody. I'd probably put him in something a little more agile, a little more concerned, because he looks pretty confident right here. Um, I'd probably give him a satchel uh, with some actual messages in it, just because it doesn't hurt to be literal in a design when you're doing something like this. Um, I'd probably give him, like, you know, uh, real quick, I'll just erase this. I'd probably give him, like, a side belt right here and, like, a satchel over here. And he'd literally have, like, you know, some scrolls and letters and stuff hanging out. Maybe one's falling out on the ground. You know, just so something a bit more obvious. <coughs> How long have I been streaming today? I just started a about, I don't know, 20 minutes ago, maybe. I'm doing this piece right here, building it up, pushing it a bit. So yesterday we, we created that Igor sketch uh, off the forum, and that felt more like just a piece of concept art, you know, it was on that gray background. It was just kind of a, here's an idea for a character. Uh, this, because it was on a vignette and because it was in a pose, the pose is really what did it, um, felt more narrative. It felt like, oh, okay, this, this is probably less concept art and more of an illustration of this character. So that's why I'm, I'm treating this differently than I treated the one yesterday. These animals have wet noses, kind of like dogs, so there's some significant, you know, shininess. grab a color layer real quick grab some blue get in here on the shadow side, especially. I don't want it to be too rich. I just want a little punch of that blue under the eye. Let me zoom in a little so you guys can see. 
I got uh, one comment on the channel today that uh, I just wanted to address real quick so I know it's an issue for people. Um, I know that this live stream is in a very low resolution. Uh, unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about it. I'll try to zoom in more when I'm doing detail stuff so you can actually sort of see what's going on. I know that a lot of the stuff I paint doesn't even really translate to the, you know, output stream because it's in such low resolution. Um, unfortunately, I'm on the Macintosh client of Livestream, which is notoriously bad. Um, streaming in high definition, or even a higher definition than the one I'm at, uh, nine times out of ten, me and Dave used to try to do it all the time when we were doing our Crimson Conversations and stuff like that, and our Critters streams. Um, nine times out of ten, streaming at a higher output, or in HD, just crashes absolutely everything. Uh, it freezes the computer. Sometimes it blue screens the computer or pinwheels it if you're on a Mac. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately, we've just learned from experience that with this particular version of live stream, you just can't really do that. So, I do apologize. Uh, I know it kind of sucks, but there's really nothing... Really nothing I can do about that, unfortunately. So, uh, these panovers are for people in art camp and other panovers I do for people that aren't in art camp. Um, I usually send them a JPEG after I'm done. Uh, with art camp, I always post the JPEGs in the forum so you can see the high resolution file and just kind of listen to the audio. And I feel like that's enough that you can kind of see what I did and listen back to the steps. So, for everybody else, though, that might not be able to see those, I do apologize. It just kind of sucks, because streaming in high definition is like, feels like driving a, I don't know, feels like driving a Volkswagen through a swamp of mud. Everything freezes, everything slows down. It's just like the worst experience, so... One thing I'm going to do, actually, is roll this pupil over so he's looking more directly at us. I feel like that'll be a bit more engaging. Yeah, it's weird. It's like live stream drops the quality because I'm streaming in low resolution to make it actually work. And then I upload it to YouTube and then that compresses it and it drops the quality even more. And it's like, uh So I, I get the complaint. I totally understand. There's just not much I can do about it. <clears throat> All right.
just playing with the face of this to make it a little more not just lemurish but also a little more character a little more character centric pushing the expression you know dropping down the curves here around the eyes to give it sort of a sort of like the eyebrows going up into the top here to give it like these almost little devil horn curves that I see that they have it just adds to the, the expression of the character trying so hard not to cough right now <clears throat> I'm going to give him a reverse widow's peak where the white kind of comes up in the middle just because he's already curved the dark is already curving down on the sides so doing it in the middle might make it feel a little too much like a pattern so I'm going to bring the white up in the middle catch some light on some hairs here so not totally done with the face yet but just little stuff like that hopefully you can see how it just makes it a little stronger especially rolling the eye over so he's looking at us All this piece is doing is making me think of Rocket Raccoon. It's all it's doing. Yeah, Richard Live. I usually do. Um, I usually do uh, whiskey, honey, apple cider, cayenne pepper, and lemon juice. It helps the throat a lot. I just ran out of those ingredients. All I've got left is honey cider and uh, lemon. I gotta go to the store tomorrow. <coughs> but uh, yeah, 
I am way too excited for Guardians of the Galaxy, and I don't usually get excited about movies. I'm not a huge, like, comic book person. I don't know anything about the Guardians of the Galaxy. I just know that one of them's a raccoon. I really don't know anything about the team. I've never read a comic of it. Um, but I'm just excited for all the artwork that's in it and all the colors and how weird the script is. I love that it, it feels like a movie that would have come out in, like, 1984. But, of course, in 1984, it wouldn't have had a budget and Rocket Raccoon would have been, like, a weird puppet. and would have been awesome, but... It's just crazy to me that they're going to take a risk on a movie like that now and blow that many millions of dollars making it look awesome because it really does look like awesome. The color palette, the art direction, like they went all out and that makes me so excited. Like imagine being a kid next week when it comes out and seeing it like feels like one of those movies, you know, like one of those movies you'd see when you were a kid that just stays with you. I like that that's coming back. Gonna put a little furrow here in the brow, a little cast shadow that the expression's making from that brow being turned up. <coughs> yeah, I love coffin. You guys want a funny joke? It's only for people that are on the live stream. No one on demand can get this joke. No one, no one on demand or YouTube is gonna get this joke. This is just for you guys. <coughs> God, I need a drink. Oh, here you go. Get it? Choking to death. Mm. too much fun with this face so bear with me
Yeah. Fucking dying. So I've been sick for three weeks, everybody. That's like almost a third of my whole summer. I missed the 4th of July. I missed all the cookouts. I was sick on my birthday. Come on, man. I just want to feel better. I've been sleeping like 15 hours a night because my body's just in like recovery mode. It's all good. I'm at the point now where I've been sick long enough that I don't care. I'm just going to do the normal stuff that I would be doing and be sick while I'm doing it until the sick goes away. Because I can't, like, lay around and take medicine anymore. I've lost too much time. <laughs> I'm at that, like, fuck it point where you just pretend you're not sick and power through it. Knighting it. Yes, that's accurate. I've never heard that expression, but I like it. I get the reference. Grab another layer here and try this out real quick. I don't know if I'm going to keep these or not. I'm just taking a look to see how they are. <coughs> uh, I think I'm going to get rid of them. They're a little unnecessary. They make them look too caddish. getting absorbed into this portrait but that's okay because it's fun Okay, I might come back to the face in a minute after I very quickly do one thing I forgot to do. But I want to look at the background real quick because I did have an idea for the background and I want to see if it works. Not 
Okay, that's what's weird. Sorry. This edge needed a little more love over here. A lot of reflected light in the shadow side of this animal. So like the back side of the snout needs a little reflection. I'm going to put him in an environment that I think is going to work for him. Uh, let's see here. Let me grab a... This is already a color layer. That's good. Drop the opacity of this brush down. I want a little less blue up here the rocks. I don't mind it so much down below because it helps against that green but up here I want a little more gray. I also want it a little bit lighter. I'm going to grab an overlay grab my white and uh, let's see, let's grab this uh, brush right here that I'm fond of. And I'm just going to kind of wash some value in. Just some atmosphere gradiating up. Let me grab this. This brush likes to lag a lot. See that's subtle, what it's starting to do. I'm going to keep building it up though. I want a little more radiation. I'm going to push this back too. darken up 
gonna do like a reverse halo and just lightly <coughs> <coughs> Ugh, I'm so pathetic it's gonna lightly darken some little choice areas around the head so those highlights pop a little bit more just kind of a little way to force the head off the canvas a bit more So, like, I could keep building this up. I'm probably going to stop for now, but just very quickly using white and black on an overlay. Um, I just started pushing the values of the background to kind of suit the character more and make them pop off a bit more. So I'm just going to click it on and off again. It's pretty subtle, but just look at how it kind of pulls the eye in more darkening the bottom to kind of make a framing that pushes the eye up that reverse halo it just kind of sets the space a bit more but yeah now I'm going to <coughs> try something that might not work, but I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to grab a multiply, I'm going to grab this gray, I'm going to grab my texture brush. This is where I'm going to start forcing narrative into the background. So again, if you don't like this, that is totally fine. This is just what I would do if I was doing this piece. So bear with me. So my idea now is that this dude, this is going to be kind of hard to explain. Let me zoom in here so you can actually see what I'm doing. My idea now is that this dude is like some martial artist, like I explained earlier, Tai Chi guy, and he's in front of this stony environment and whatnot, so right off the bat. My idea is that this is some kind of old temple that he's a part of, that maybe he's defending, maybe he trained at, maybe he's, you know, the last student of it or whatever. You can apply any story from it, adding little elements to make it look like it's some kind of ruin. Used to force some narrative into the piece. But, uh, oh. Freezing. Got it. So, I'm going to pull from some Tibetan design influence, because that's like a very, you know, mountainy culture in the kind of same area that I feel like this dude could be from, and I'm going to pull some of that and just kind of bullshit in some quick stuff here. Uh, so, very rudimentary kind of meditation pose here. Uh, I've got the cloth here. I'll give him the same kind of thing that he has around his neck, maybe. And then I'm going to do a 
stylized lemur. Something play with this real quick until it doesn't look so goofy. I'm putting it a little askew <coughs> so it's like the walls falling apart and it's kind of slumping down. You gotta simplify when you're doing stuff like carving and look at actual carvings to see like you know it's like a it's like a Baz relief kind of thing. So there's shadows under the forms that are carved out because they are very, very lightly pulled out of the stone around them. So under the arms, the pits, the chin. Give a cast shadow in the eyes. <coughs> Under here, I'm gonna give him the kind of halo chakra thing. Why that his legs are folded down here. <coughs> Have that cool tail become a design element of the carving. I'm looking at some actual Tibetan stuff on my other screen right now. Add some cracks in it. Again, if anyone has any questions or stuff they'd like me to talk about, just drop them in the chat. I'll be more than happy to. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I'm going <coughs> to just kind of sink into render mode here. shelf here, the base of it. So maybe this was some kind of shrine carved into this wall. It just it just gives a setting and a context to where he is and what he's doing. It's just a simple little thing. 
And again, this is just what I would do if this was my piece. If you don't like what I'm doing with the background and the narrative, just focus on the other parts of the critique. Every crit presents different opportunities to address different problems in like image making. So with this one, it's building a narrative, uh, narrative environment for a character, which is something I don't think we've really discussed on here so far for Art Camp. So I'm going to take this opportunity to kind of do that. Yes, this is a crit. Critting this piece. It is not my piece unknown. <coughs> Why are you sorry? Carving anatomy is so off. Sorry, I'm just trying to do some general stuff, but still keep it true to the sort of stuff you'd see in a Tibetan temple relief. <coughs> How soon should you start thinking about narrative in pieces? I always struggle with the narrative. Um, I mean, that depends for everybody. The, the narrative might be the first thing you think of. You might have a really great idea for a story that you want to visualize in a piece, and the narrative is the very first thing. Um, yes, I am sick. I'm, not, I'm coming off being sick, but my throat just will not get better. Um, so the narrative could be the very first thing you think of, and that could be what drives the piece. That could be the reason you're doing the piece. Uh, on the other hand, like we did here, you could start with a character and just draw a character in a pose that works that you really like. And then, you know, basically what I just did was I looked at this and I thought it looked like this guy was some kind of fighter, some kind of Tai Chi dude getting ready <laughs> to brawl with somebody. So I started thinking what kind of environments are those people in? And I thought, okay, where would they train? And then I thought, okay, if this was like a movie or a children's book... What kind of environments would I want to see that it'd be cool to tell this guy's story? And then I was like, oh, like, you know, spooky overgrown temple and, like, all this cool stuff. And that's what I would want to see. So that's what I started building off of. So then I, you know, added the ruin, adding the elements of the ruined temple, adding the Tai Chi stuff, uh, you know, pulling a lot of reference from Thailand and Tibet. Um, but... <coughs> But yeah, so that starts to basically, I mean, like narrative can be a very simple thing. Like this is an extremely simple narrative. This is, there was a temple of lemur dudes that were martial artists and spiritual, which you can tell from the relief, but it's in disrepair. Maybe it's gone. Maybe they're all dead. Who knows? But this temple has not been taken care of because this wall is cracking and it's askew. This guy is the same animal as the thing in the carving, so clearly he's a part of it. He's in a pose. He's wearing the outfit, you know. So this is a very simple narrative. It's This used to be some kind of group that was very illustrious because they had these reliefs in these shrines, and since something has happened to them, and maybe this guy is the last member of it, maybe he came back here on some kind of journey, Maybe he's looking for something, you know, you can plug in the rest of the narrative, you can leave it up to the viewer. But basically putting him in this environment creates a question for the viewer. It's, oh, okay, I get what he is, but, you know, look at this place he is, why is he there, what's happening? And when you can create questions like that for the viewer, 
it instantly draws them in and makes them a part of the illustration because they want to know what happens next. And the way the brain works is they'll start plugging in their own answers like I just started doing with the piece where it's like, oh, you know, maybe he's the last one or, you know, wouldn't it be cool if this was this? And that makes them engaged with your piece. It makes them invested in your piece. It makes them think about your piece. It makes them, you know, it, it, it makes it interesting and it lets them participate in the image. And when you have an opportunity to let the viewer participate in the image and really get drawn into a very vague story that they can put a lot of their own ideas into, that's a really cool opportunity because it, those are the images that people kind of remember. You know, those are the images where people are like, you know, I always thought that this was this, or whenever I see this, I think of that. And like, that's, that's a cool opportunity that you don't want to miss. So yeah, this is, you know, it's, it's specific to a degree, but there's a lot of vagary going on. <coughs> it's specific in its culture and its execution and its pose, but how he got here, who he is, and why this happened is all completely left up to the viewer. It draws them in and lets them fill in those gaps themselves and kind of participate in the story. I'm going to add some more carved elements to show that this wasn't just one shrine, it was a whole wall that's fallen apart and is in pieces. Hmm. <laughs> And again, where this all started from was just the simple fact that you included a rock in your vignette of where this dude was going to stand. That's where all of this came from. It was just, oh, there's a rock. It must have come off of something, because it's big and it's jagged, so let's put something in the environment that makes sense for the rock.
Any other questions, concerns, things you'd like to discuss? I'm so sorry to everybody on YouTube who's just listening to me cough. I'm so sorry. I'll be critiquing for about another 45 minutes probably and then I'll be done for tonight and then I'll be back tomorrow. I'm critiquing every day this week so I can't give you times because it depends on when my client work is done and I have time to get on here but I will be critiquing every day this week. So, up here, if you can't see it, let me get in here. I don't know if you can see it on demand or not, but uh, we've got this lemur shrine thing up here, which is in this carved, cracked shrine, which reinforces the character and gives him a purpose in this setting. And over here, I'm just pulling from some Tibetan design of this goddess. Just roughing it in very quickly. Just to give this wall a bit more of a, a finished character. And then there's this big gouge in the wall that is going to cut that off. 
little bit, a bit of a cast shadow here. Oh, I'm probably just going to be doing this piece tonight, unknown, but I will be back tomorrow for more crits. Um, are you part of Art Camp Unknown? Because I've been doing these for, uh, for Art Camp. <coughs> <coughs> if you catch me on here live streaming when I'm not doing Art Camp stuff, I'll definitely critique your stuff, but, uh, these are scheduled class things for students of Art Camp, so I gotta take the work off of the forums from there for these sessions. Apologies for that. But yeah, if you catch me on here live streaming, uh, doing personal work or something and you need a crit, just ask. I'll be more than happy to. But for a certain number of hours each week, I am in instructor mode. So I gotta give preference to the uh, the students I'm working with. I'm almost done fiddling with this background. Apologies. I just really wanted to really push this illustration to really like get a good discussion about building narrative from just, you know, a piece of concept art. Because I think uh I think a lot of people in in the art camp and in general on um on all the art sites and forums, uh, a lot of people have a lot of characters they've drawn. And they don't seem to understand how easily those could become illustrations with just some, you know, clever thinking and problem solving. And um, I think this is a good topic, really, to kind of address because potentially all those character designs are fully, you know, fleshed out portfolio pieces if you put the time into them to make them illustrations. And, you know, as you're seeing from here, I've only been working on this for like an hour you can very quickly take something from just piece of character art to, you know, narrative splash image of, you know, this character in this environment. Suddenly they have a purpose, they have a story, you know, they exist in this, this little world. And, um, yeah, I think a lot of people don't really understand how easy it is to take a character sketch and make it an illustration. Um, you can do it with almost any character sketch as long as it's not a static pose. I, I mean, you can still do it with static poses, but it's a little more boring because they're just sort of standing there. <coughs> but the second you give a character uh, design any kind of life, any kind of pose, any kind of action, um, you can build a world and a story and a background and a purpose around that uh pretty quickly uh, as long as you kind of just tackle the right things in the right order so I'd be interested to see if anybody could take this crit and run with one of their own pieces and just kind of turn a piece of what you thought was concept art because maybe you don't think you're an illustrator yet or maybe you think doing illustrations is harder than concept art and just you know take that piece of concept art that's built on what you think are your limitations and push it into a finished piece. I think uh, I think everybody can do it. I just think people are kind of tied down by this belief that drawing characters is fun and easy and illustrations take more work and are hard and intimidating. But that's not, you know, that's not the case. One can dovetail into the other very nicely.
Yeah, I'd love to see people try and take these character sketches and push them into a new into a new sort of level that they haven't tried to do before. I think you could learn a lot. So, I mean, very quickly, that's, you know, that's my background I roughed in. It's a crumbled old temple. He's in a place now. Um, I'm going to grab an overlay layer. Maybe a, I'm going to play with a soft light, actually. Yeah, I'm going to do a soft light layer. Because I want to have a desaturated light, almost like a bounce light. So then I'm going to come in here very quickly, because I don't want to spend too much time on this. And uh, just like how the bottoms cast shadows, the tops are going to catch a little bit of light. Because these aren't deep carvings, but they are rounded. person who painted this, have I completely lost you or are you still with me? <coughs> I apologize, I kind of chose your piece to be the vehicle to talk about a bigger issue that I'm seeing in people's work, so it became less about refining your character and more about the issue of concept art plus illustration plus, you know, pushing work and all this other stuff, so... Sorry you won the lottery on that, but uh, you did, and here we are. See what that quick light pass does just to pull it forward? It's not even like anything, it's just five seconds with a soft light layer set to white, and instantly this feels more like a rock carving.
cool. <clears throat> Grab another multiply. I'm going to start pushing some stuff on the character around. Like, based on the lighting you've set up, this arm should be significantly more in shadow. What? Sorry. Dan DeSalt is messaging me. I don't know if you guys know Dan DeSalt. He still hasn't learned that I only respond to Skype. I don't know how many times I've told him. Don't Google message me, bro. I don't use that shit. <laughs> no, this is a multiply layer. Uh, overlay layer set to black takes the underlying color and makes a darker, richer value of that color. An overlay layer set to white makes a lighter, richer value of that color. Multiply takes the color you've selected and basically adds a relative gray of that color on top of something. So it pushes it back. I used an overlay, uh, well I usually, I was going to use an overlay, but I used a soft light to pull the, uh, the light out of those rocks in the background. But yeah. Just playing with curving forms and dropping light in the character here. That belt buckle's like way too bright. Wouldn't be catching much light at all, maybe in the top corner. Push the silhouette a bit more over here. Clean up the edges. We'll grab a normal layer and start. Remember, I spoke earlier about the artifacting being an issue. I'm going to start addressing that. Artifacting is always a pain in the ass to get rid of. I'm going to very quickly get rid of most of it, but not all of it. Because it's paint over. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be enough. Just has to be enough. But yeah, what artifacting does, especially coming off a light background like the one you had when you started, it just makes this really awkward rim light that kind of makes all the edges pop. And it, it really, really messes up where the character is sitting in space. And it just kind of makes all the edges feel sort of gross and weird. So. Now that he's on a dark background, 
gonna make the dark edges darker. And uh, yeah. Get rid of that, like right here, that line right there on the edge, that gross line. I'm just gonna get rid of it. <coughs> I'm paint into it with the background color and uh, get rid of it. A little bit of rim light with the actual light color that the piece is rooted in now. So I'm going to be on here for a little bit longer if anyone has uh, anything they'd like me to cover before I get off of here tonight. Feel free to ask. I will be more than happy to talk about anything and everything. Clothing design tips, maybe. I kind of thought too general when designing this dude's clothing. Now that there is more Tibetan thing going on, I think the Tibetan influence would be the character. Um, it's already kind of in the character. Um, that's why I kind of went with the Tibetan feel, is because he's already got this kind of uh, 
long one piece robe with sleeves and like the clasps in the middle like these ties and then he's got this very oriental uh you know thing holding his cloak back um it's already kind of there i mean you can definitely push those elements the wraps definitely feel like some kind of martial arts culture um but yeah i can probably push the clothing a little bit towards the end but yeah the clothing isn't bad it's really just the uh the patterns like you know you've got circles and squares and you know that's fine but those are like really 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 basic patterns something with a little more uh purpose would probably help kind of putting this character in an oculus right now which means that there's a beam of light coming down out of the ceiling and it's kind of landing right where he's standing to kind of launch him into the forefront so darkening the edges lightening up the middle coming down I always like the way that looks. Makes it look really iconic. Kind of gives it the ruin feel, like maybe he's inside a building that actually has grass on the floor. This overgrown, weird place. Hi there, grilled chicken. It's a great name, by the way. How you create the beam of light that you see dust particles in? Uh, you just make the beam of light a little more intense, and then you take a texture brush that looks like dust, and you just, you know, the dust is going to be brightest where the brightest light is, and then it's going to fade down. Like, if I did it here, you'd see dust up in here, but you wouldn't see dust down here. You know what I mean? I've got a silly question if you guys from art camp don't have any. How do you think when starting out one should work on personal stuff and studies in a way that leads to improvement? Uh, well, the general, the general <coughs> take on that uh, in the art community is usually there's fundamental studies and then there's applied studies. And you got to do both. And uh, fundamental studies are just things that help everything, like anatomy, color, lighting. You know, no matter what style you choose, whether it's, you know, cartoony and Pixar, whether it's realistic Marvel Comics stuff, like, 
no matter what style you go into, fundamentals are fundamentals. Color and light is still important. You still need to know anatomy, even if you're exaggerating it and stylizing it. So those are like, you know, studies that you just have to do to do. Those are, you know, you can do those forever and never master them. No one is a master of light. No one's a master of anatomy. There's always more to learn. That's like, you know, those are the, those are the, the big ones that you just kind of have to do. Uh, then there's applied studies, which is like, you know, let's say you're doing a bunch of personal work of dudes wearing armor. Um, you want to study armor to figure out how metal works, to figure out how metal rusts, to figure out how it's put together structurally so you can draw it more accurately. <clears throat> Those are studies that you apply to the piece that you're doing. It's like, okay, I did this study of armor. Let's take what I learned from it and put it into my piece that has armor in it. You apply it to it to make the piece look stronger. But, yeah. So, I would say you should always be doing more personal work than studies, which is a problem a lot of people uh, have. Um, it's just, uh, you can kind of get into it. Me and, me and Dave Raposa, when we were doing Crimson Daggers uh, really heavily back when um, I took over a couple years ago, we used to talk about this thing called study sickness, which um, is very, very prevalent, which happens to a lot of people, where um, it's it's much easier to make a study look good than it is to make a piece of personal work look good, because in a study you're copying something, and you know you have a reference right there and you know what to do, so if you push it hard enough, long enough, you can make a study look really good. And people get really into that, and they, they want to do good studies and show them online and be like, look at the studies I did. Aren't these studies good? And, you know, suddenly they're not doing as much personal work because they think that studying is what's going to make them better, and they think that studying is what's going to look good in their portfolio because the studies are, you know, based on something, and they, they have a better outcome than your personal work with a quicker turnaround. But that's an illusion because you're not actually creating anything when you're doing a study. You're not actually... If you have a whole portfolio full of studies, none of that's like your work, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you did them, but they're not they're not an accurate reflection of what you're able to do creatively. They're what you're able to do deductively. It's where, you know, oh, okay, if I have a reference, I can recreate that reference really, really well, but if you ask me to design something from scratch, I'm totally useless. Like, so it's a false positive, and then people start doing nothing but studying, and they're like, well, I study all the time, but I don't really do any personal work. I don't really have a portfolio. I'm just kind of focusing on getting better. That's the thing you always hear, like, well, I'm just going to study for a long time and get better, and then I'll do pieces. And it's like, that's not how you get better. <laughs> you get better by doing a ton of really bad personal work and studying and seeing the flaws you're making in your personal work so you know what to study. All of your bad personal work is the roadmap for what you should be studying to get better. Doing that bad piece of personal work where the arm is completely broken is what informs you, oh, I should really study arms. Doing that landscape painting that you really hate because the colors are all crazy absolutely is what defines the fact that you need to do more color studies. Like, That's how you know how you should improve. But if all you do is study all the time, you get study sickness, which is kind of like snow blindness for artists pretty much. You don't really know where you're at. You don't have an accurate gauge on your strengths and weaknesses. And you're just, you know, copying stuff and copying stuff and copying stuff all the time. You're not actually creating anything. It's an illusion of creativity. And that's a, that's a really big problem. So to get back to your question, how to study and do personal work to improve, I would say a 75-25 split or even an 80-20 split is probably best. You know, like, I would say do 75% work off the top of your head, and then do 25%, 30% studies. Um, but really, really work hard on the studies. You know what I mean? Like, you get better faster when you're drawing off the top of your head. That's what we used to call memory studies, where you draw a body in the same pose 20 times, and then you put all of your reference away, and you draw it from the top of your head, based on what you actually remembered and retained. And that's like, okay, this is, this is what I actually learned from drawing those 20 bodies. This is what the sponge in my brain absorbed from doing that exercise. And you get a really good idea, and then, you know, you do it again and again and again. I used to do that. I haven't done it in a long time because I'm incredibly busy and incredibly lazy. Because, let me tell you, this is another thing that I absolutely believe is that uh, 
what's what's the phrase? I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say it incorrectly. It's basically uh, like comfort is the death of drive, pretty much. And like, I'm not comfortable in terms of like I love my work. I'm great. Like I don't feel that way at all. I hate my work, and I got tons of stuff I gotta focus on to get better. But I'm comfortable in terms of I have so much work coming in that I don't really have to worry about bills right now. And that psychologically makes me put studies on the back burner, as it does with tons of other people. There's a reason people go and house at studios as artists and then they flatline on their improvement till they come out of the studio. It's because suddenly they have like $90,000 salary and benefits and whatever else it's going to be. And that, you know, that your brain shuts that part of itself off for most people because that's, you know, that's not a thing you're worrying about anymore. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's all, that's all stuff to, to think about. I apologize for going off on a tangent there. But yeah, don't do nothing but study. That's the worst thing you can do. When you see people on Facebook that are like, studies from today, and it's like every day, and it's just like 30 pages of like, you know, just drawings that are copied from photos, and there's no personal work, it's like, so what did you actually do today? Like, use those studies, do something with them. Like, that, that's good, but don't just copy stuff off the internet and say it's studying. You have to apply that stuff. Like, you have to apply it. You can't just study for a test and never take the test. You don't learn anything that way. You can't prepare all the elements for an experiment and then not do the experiment. You know, you don't learn anything that way. It's a, it's a I mean, the best term for it, I already used it, it's a false positive. It's an illusion that you did something, but you didn't actually do anything. And you get all those good feelings of having done something. But you didn't actually do anything. There's all different ways to study. There's no one right way to do it. You know, it's like there's so many different ways to study based on the results you want to get in your work. It's like crazy. So if people say you're doing it wrong, don't really, you know, take take that with a grain of salt because there's all kinds of artists that people say we're doing it wrong that are great now. You know, it's like the go-to example that we always talk about is um, Brad Rigney. Where everybody said, you know, you you know, painting with the smudge tool is like a joke. You can't do that. Like blah 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 blah. And then Brad showed up out of nowhere, and like blew everybody's minds. And they were like, how does this guy create these paintings? What is this technique he's using? And then they were like, oh, he's painting with the smudge tool. And then suddenly everyone goes, oh, that's, it's a legitimate way to work, I guess. Like you know, it's like don't, don't listen to people. If something's working for you and you're getting better and you're learning from it, just do it. But make sure you're actually getting better and learning from it and that it's not a false positive. Don't trace photographs and go, my stuff looks so photographic, I must be getting better. Like, no. Like, have the balls to be an adult about your work and look at it and go, did I actually learn anything here? Or did I just create an illusion where my outcome matched the reference? Like, really, really, really be honest with yourself. Are you actually learning something? Or are you just making a bunch of pretty little illusions to put in a portfolio and go, I can render a photo real because I took a photo and I color sampled all of it and I painted over the photo. Like that's not not improvement. Anyways, that's my, my rant on that. Hopefully it was helpful to somebody. I apologize. <clears throat> I was never working. See, it's a weird thing to go back to this. Um, you guys will probably experience this to some degree, though. I hope you don't. I hope you don't uh, go through the same thing I went through. Um, but I was never working harder than when I was completely broke and I was awake every night wondering if I was going to be able to pay my rent that month. 
I was improving so fast when that was my life. It was like month to month to month, I was like empirically, visually better, and I was noticing it, and it was great. And then I started getting tons of work, and that's great too. That's awesome. You know, that's the payoff. That's the success. I'm not complaining about that. That's what you want to happen. But once that starts happening and you get a certain kind of lifestyle comfort and those those stressful all-nighters of, you know, can I even afford food this week, once that's gone, your improvement starts to plateau and just, it's just gone. You know what I mean? It's like, you can get it back. Not everybody goes through that. There are people that just improve, improve, improve constantly. But it's a very small number of people, and that's the reason why. I don't claim to be some kind of, you know, study prodigy who just got better and better and better and better. I totally understand that once my bills were paid and I was making a profit, that part of my brain just shut off. I just went into finish mode. I'm going to do my work, I'm going to do my personal work, and that's it. And, like, I hate that. That's not a choice. That's not being like, oh, you know, this is how I want to be. That's just the reality of the situation. And it happens to tons of people. Once you identify that, like, I've been studying again for the first time in a really long time. Like, this summer, I've, you know, I have the free time now that I have some money saved up to be able to study. And that was a conscious choice to get back into doing that because you have to do it. You know, you absolutely just have to do it if you want to get better. It's not a decision. You know, it's just, you, you don't get to say, well, I'm not going to study. I'll just improve naturally. It's like, you have to study. That's how you do it. Do I recommend getting in debt like Dave did? Uh, okay, so quick backstory for anyone listening on demand who might not know this about uh, Dave Raposa. <clears throat> Dave, uh, to make himself get better faster, he basically got a credit card and bought more shit than he could afford and put himself in debt. The idea being that now he has to work harder to make more money to pay that stuff off or he's going to default on all that debt and his life's going to be ruined. Um... Yes, it worked for him, but I'm don't know, I can't recommend that people do that. You know what I mean? Like I can't say that you should go do that. Dave's the kind of person that was able to do that because he at the time was, you know, living in a low rent place. Um he was splitting costs with his girlfriend to a degree, not half half, but you know, he had a little extra backup. Um, he didn't have any kind of social life whatsoever. He was inside 24 hours a day and he's just the kind of person that can say, I'm going to do something and just do it. And not everybody is that person. Uh, you can become that person if you push yourself really hard, but not everyone is in a place where I can say, yeah, just, you know, go $10,000 into debt and it'll make you a better artist because then you'll have to work, you know? Uh, yeah, that might help some people, but it might destroy other people's lives. So, uh, I'm not going to recommend it. Um, I'm just going to say that that's what he did because he, he wanted, he wanted pressure that wouldn't let up. Basically, he wanted something that was going to not go away where no matter what he did, he had to do more for a long period of time. He basically wanted, like, a ticking clock in the corner that was just going to, like, you know, make him run a marathon. And, uh, or, like, you know, diffuse the bomb that was his life, basically, by going into debt. So, yeah, it worked for him. Uh, I know other people that have gone into debt and have just ruined their lives. And no matter what they did, you know, they worked hard, but they couldn't get out of it. They didn't go into debt intentionally, it's just happened that way. But, anyway, uh, yeah. He did do that. I don't recommend it. I just observed it. I would say just be strict with yourself. Because another thing Dave did that made him really good that I was doing for a long time that made me significantly better than I was when I got out of school that, you know, other people in Crimson Daggers did that made them better is the simplest thing in the world. And it's just to make a schedule and stick to the schedule no matter what. 
set aside two or three hours to just draw from the top of your head every day and really gauge where you're at day to day to day. Set aside an hour or two every morning where you're going to do a study and just do it. Just make a plan and stick to the plan. Like... You should, you know, everybody in here has the discipline to do that. If you don't, you're just making excuses. You know what I mean? Like, you're just being lazy if you say, well, I don't have the discipline to do that. I would end up watching TV. It's like, yeah, because you're making the decision to watch TV. You have the discipline to do it. You're just choosing not to do it. I would say that that would be more helpful than, you know, getting a credit card and going into debt. Just make a schedule and stick to it because... A little bit of work every day becomes a lot of work at the end of the month, and a lot of work every day becomes a significant amount of work at the end of the month. So just, you know, if you do it five hours a day every day, that's 150 hours of work at the end of the month, you know what I mean? If you do it 10 hours a day, that's 300 hours of work at the end of the month. It just, you know, set aside what you can do realistically, do the most you possibly can realistically every day, and you'll get better. You'll be multiple times better by this time next year than you are right now if you study and do something from your imagination every day for a year. It will work. It's not even a question. It absolutely will work. But again, disclaimer, it'll only work if you're honest with yourself. If you trace a photo of a dude... And then you draw, like, you know, some shoulder pads on them and a belt. And you say, this is my character design. Look at my anatomy. It looks like a photo. Yeah, it's not going to work for you. Mm. At all. So. Hmm. Anyway, I hope that helped. That long-winded explanation. I got another uh, probably 15-20 minutes on here and then I'm going to be gone. I'm just looking at some stuff to do to pull this together a bit more in that time.
Oh, thanks, Anonymous. That's nice of you to say. I'm really glad that uh, Noah gave me an ability to be able to come back and do more of these because, oh man, I did not have time to do critique and paint over with my schedule. I just had too much client stuff. So this is nice. It's nice to get back into doing this. I like having these uh, these talks, discussions. I love looking at people's work. I love discussing what people are doing with their designs and where they want to take them and all that good stuff. Get a little bullshit shadow back there for his tail. <clears throat> yeah, you can ask a question. Go ahead. Feel free. I'm just working on this little vignette and how it's going to sit in the space down here. Then I'm probably going to be done. I could go on and on and on about the clothing and the, you know, the way the shadows are working and all that stuff, but like with any paint over, you kind of got to pick the couple things you're going to address. Cuz you can't, you know, you can't finish the whole piece. You just got to pick the things you think are the the biggest the biggest things. And for me, that was the face, the background, the lighting, the narrative. Is there a way to work on doing more extreme values because I see that my drawing is too mid tony I mean, I know my problem is just hard fixing it. Uh, okay, so you said, okay, so are, is this a value problem in drawing or in painting? Are you, are you drawing with like a pencil and, or line art digitally or is this your painting values with a brush? Because the answer is going to be a little different for each of those. Both? Okay. Um, well, there's a very short answer that I kind of like that uh, someone said. I can't remember who it was. Someone in the, some artist I used to follow, like crazy, said it. Um, if you're having trouble with your values and they're too tame and they're not going far enough, the best thing you can do is push them till you break the image, make them way too extreme and then dial it back till it looks right. You know what I mean? Like, so if you do something that's really washed out, put filters on it and completely break it to the point where you're like, wow, that's way too much. And then dial it back by degrees until you go, oh, you, that looks about right. You know what I mean? Like, um, sometimes you don't know where, because, you know, you always want that right, right before something's broken at the highest point of tension is usually the highest point of interest visually. For some reason, that just seems to happen over and over again. It's like, it's like the it's like the Conan rule with Frazetta. Um, when he's drawing a character swinging a sword, 
it's either the moment right before the sword hits the guy or the moment right after it hits the guy and you're seeing the trail come off the dude. Um, it's the moment, moment of highest tension and the moment right after the point of highest tension. Those are the two most interesting things to illustrate in that moment of him swinging a sword. And it's the same sort of thing with values. It's like right before the values are completely blown out is the perfect point of light versus dark. You know what I mean? Like, uh, unless you're going for something stylistic and it's really, you know, purposefully low value or something like that. But, um, but yeah, so it's basically just, number one, do a lot of life studies. Um, set up something like a bust or like a little head, plaster mold, fruit, anything on your desk and just draw it from life and look at how values actually work in reality. Don't just copy photos and stuff because those can be kind of misleading. So do a lot of that. And then if you're still having a problem with it, take your values and really push them intentionally. Make them ex so extreme, you know what I mean? Like really, really push them. And then just go, okay, well that's too much. And then dial it back by degrees until it looks about right. Figure out, you know, it's like the same thing with my color blindness. I know that my colors are about 25% too desaturated in my work. So I know exactly how much to boost them. To get them into a zone where they feel about right, you can identify, you know, the value range you're having a problem with if you do enough work and you line it up and you observe it. You can figure out, oh, okay, I'm about 30% you know, below where I need to be with the contrast in all my pieces. There's going to be a trend in your images that you can follow and you can gradually fix. So it's just a matter of doing it a lot. That's really like, you know, the, the go-to answer with all these questions is you're going to have to do a lot of work on it. But that being said, with that lot of work, you know, look at all your stuff really really analyze it figure out what value range is causing you the problem is your stuff too washed out is it too light gray is it too dark make sure your monitors properly calibrated if you're painting because if it isn't your stuff's gonna look way darker than it actually is or way lighter than it actually is um, so yeah I can't stress that part enough get a calibrated monitor uh, everybody because otherwise your value studies aren't going to mean shit because you're not seeing accurate values you know it's like how can you study it if you can't see it so that's the first thing you need to do is invest in the proper material get something that's going to show you accurate value how do you check your monitor? Uh, there's all different kinds of ways um, you can get a monitor that's already calibrated, like a Dell UltraSharp or, uh, you know, the iMac models, or I, I use a Mac, but uh, I don't know. Mac is, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work with it, so I understand that a lot of people don't. Um, but yeah, like the Dell UltraSharps are usually pretty good. Everybody loves those. Um, but as far as calibrating a monitor, I think they sell calibrators. There might be websites now where you can do tests and manually adjust. Um, see, this is a weird thing for me to answer because I don't actually have to do it because I've got an iMac that's calibrated. I don't have to go do it, but I think there's monitor settings where you can adjust the calibration on most monitors. And I know that there's probably websites, and I know that there are external calibrators you can actually buy because uh, Dave used to have one. Uh, I remember seeing it. But yeah, you know, just, just go to Google and type in how to calibrate a monitor for accurate color and value. Go just do some quick research on it, and you'll, you'll figure out how to do it pretty quick. But um, yeah, so it's like, for example, if I take this piece. Uh, Alright, so here's this illustration looking the way it does. Now again, if you're looking at this on an uncalibrated monitor right now, it's already wrong. But I'm going to do a quick exercise to show you what not calibrated monitors will do to an image. So let's pretend that right now, regardless of your monitor, what you're seeing for this image is correct. This is how the artist intended it, theoretically, for this exercise. Not having a calibrated monitor. If your monitor is too dark, this could be what other people see when you put it on the internet. Okay? So to you, it looks like this. 
because your monitor is off and the colors are too bright. Your monitor is way too bright. So when you put it on a calibrated monitor and those values sink down based on what you were painting, everybody sees this. That's what your image actually is. And because it's so down in the black, photoshopping it up might not work. Those colors might not be able to be recovered once the image is flat. Okay. On the flip side of that, let's see here. On the flip side of that, let's say your monitor is way too dark. So you're seeing this. You're seeing this. This is what you think you painted, but you go to a calibrated monitor and suddenly it looks like this and all the values are washed out and all the colors are sapped and everything's crazy. That's what everybody else is seeing, okay? That's what calibration problems will do to your image. It'll cripple your entire portfolio and it'll make all of your value and color studies completely obsolete. So be careful and make sure your monitor is calibrated. I hope that, uh, did that make sense with the levels thing? That's the easiest way to explain how it works. <clears throat> Uh, most Macs are automatically calibrated. Uh, they kind of, that's the thing is, they're calibrated, but sometimes the colors are too rich. Um, you can find all kinds of articles and stuff online if you look it up for what monitors are the best ones to paint on. I do know that the Dell Ultra Sharp is like the, everybody says that that's like their go-to. Um, for a long time now, that's been a thing. So... You know, those are good. There's lots of other good monitors, though. So there's tons and tons of forum posts. You can, uh, you can find all kinds of lists of which ones are good, which ones you should get. So, And remember, uh, if you're in the United States, I can't speak for other countries because I don't know what the rules are, but um, if you make any money as an artist at all this year, which, you know, just think about that. Um, your monitor is a tax deduction, so you can kind of you can kind of get that as a business expense on Uncle Sam's dime. Even if you work at, like, an office or something and you need a computer, uh, you could probably get away with buying a nice monitor and saying that you, you know, needed it for work. So just find any excuse to get a good monitor that works. Just do it. Or if you want to be a huge asshole, go to like a Best Buy or a department store, if you're in another country that doesn't have Best Buy, and buy a monitor calibrator and bring it home and calibrate your monitor. And then go back to the store and say, this didn't work. Uh, I'm really sorry. Can I please return it? Because most places have a no questions asked return policy as long as it's not broken. So just use it. Bring it back, return it, be an asshole, whatever. You know, just do what you gotta do. Buy a calibrator, calibrate your shit, return it, and then when you make a bunch of money off freelance, you know what I mean? Go back and buy something at that store, whatever, if you feel bad. Pay it forward, pay it later, whatever you gotta do. But, yeah, if you don't have a calibrated monitor, none of this matters, because everything you do is going to be wrong. So yeah, monitor calibration, it's an important thing. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to do a couple quick things and then I'm going to get off of here because...
I'm at my time quota and my throat is starting to lose all feeling. <coughs> so, probably means it's time to give it a rest. Is the value advice the same for pencil drawing? Uh, it's similar. Um, with pencil drawing, basically, you've got a couple extra problems in the bag. Um, some pencils are lighter than other pencils. There's only so much value you can get out of an H compared to a B. Uh, there's only so much black you can get out of a pencil compared to charcoal. You know what I mean? Like, um, it's a whole other issue of, like, if your drawings look too light, your drawings look too light and you feel like you know it's blah 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 and then you find I find out that you're using a 4H pencil it's like well just use a heavier pencil you know like use a darker lead you know I don't know what your pencil setup is but there's all kinds of reasons your values might not be what they you want them to be when you're using traditional media because there's so many options for how to do that um, and there's no like filters you know I can't be like you know drop a levels filter on your sketchbook like you can't you can't do that but, uh, but yeah. I would say one exercise that's really helpful that I used to do in school, uh, let me, uh, this is one of the only things I did in school that actually taught me something, actually. Um, I'm going to quickly make a new file here. So take your pencil that you like drawing with and uh, do this. Try this, okay? Theoretically, let's say the pencil can go to black. It can't. No pencil is black. But let's say you could. Make a grid like this. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <clears throat> so, okay. Take your pencil that you like drawing with, or pencils. You can do this with multiple pencils. And just try to figure out how many values you can actually get out of it. Uh, the way I was taught was to do a ten scale, where you really bear down on the pencil without breaking it, and you get the darkest possible value. No value, of course, is white. So then, go down from there and go, okay, what's almost black but not black that I can get out of this pencil? What's, what's the closest thing to it? And then go, okay, well, i got to go lighter than that, but not too much lighter than that. And really, really start to experiment with the range of value you can get out of the tool that you're using. Because you might be surprised at the subtlety you can get out of something like a pencil the range of grays you can get out of that one single thing and build this whole thing up you know and figure it out and then you know after you've done that a few times with each one look at the range and go oh the reason my values aren't dark enough is because the pencil I'm using actually doesn't sink that low you know what I mean like it's it's not actually capable of doing it Well, there's no definitive best thing for sketching. It's whatever you like to use. There's great digital artists that swear by the stylus, and there's great traditional artists that swear by the pencil. It's different for everybody. Don't think that one is more valuable than the other. It's not. Unless you're talking money, because you can sell an original piece, and if you have a sketch for a painting you did, you can make more money by selling the sketch. That's the only time that traditional is more valuable than digital, is when you have an original that you can sell. It doesn't matter if you think the calibration is better or worse, Grilled, as long as it's accurate. Your, your opinion on it 
doesn't matter as long as the calibration is accurate. True color is true color. I mean, really, what tool you decide to use for drawing isn't as important as the drawing you create, you know what I mean? If you get good results, you get good results, whatever. Some people love brush pens. Some people still use a quill with an inkwell, you know what I mean? If it works for you, it works for you. There's no such thing as a more valid medium than another one. That's all bullshit. It's what you can do with it as an artist that matters. Oh man, I'm almost done. Throat is killing me. So I'll be back tomorrow. Uh, I'll be doing another crit on another piece. I don't know what piece yet. There's a few that I'd like to get to this week, but again, if you joined us late and you didn't hear earlier, uh, I've been crazy sick. Tonsillitis. Sorry about that making up my hours this week by doing extra streams, extra amount of hours. So, uh, yeah, I'll be back tomorrow for more. And, uh, yeah, I'll be covering a lot of stuff this week, so. I can't do more than probably one a day, though, because my throat gets really, really raw if I talk too long, which is already starting to happen. And then I, uh, cough like crazy Some down here. Just want to sap a little more of the blue out of certain areas so I keep the vibrant colors in the middle. anyways uh, I could I might even come back and do more crits on this piece tomorrow because I could get into the costume and really push it I'm not sure if I'm going to though because there's a lot of other work to look at but um, I'll figure that out later basically I'm gonna flatten this down to the pasted layer that I had and then we can do some before and after um, views and then I'll get off of here so Duplicate the background. Let me shut off the bottom. Merge visible. And, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, here's the piece for today. 
and this is the before and after. Just to recap, um, today's was taking a piece of concept art and turning it into an illustration, adding narrative, and then a general critique and paint over of the character himself. So that's what we covered. I might cover more of it tomorrow. I might push this further. I'm not sure yet. Uh, let me get in here. We pushed a lot of the face. So, but yeah. Anyways, uh, let me get the character kind of centered here. There's all kinds of stuff in the costume I could talk about. So, for this purposes of this paint over, it was the stuff I mentioned a minute ago. Taking a piece of concept art, making a narrative, building it into an illustration. Covered all kinds of stuff. So... This was a lot of fun. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow. I don't know what piece I'm going to be doing, but uh, yeah, check the Art Camp Forum or the Hip Chat uh, Art Camp Room. I'll be posting in there whenever I go live, as always. And um, thanks for coming, uh, everybody. And uh, I'll uh, talk to you guys later. Have a good night.